Okay, welcome back. Uh, it's been a little bit of time, but I have a new video. We recently had a game session with the uh, first edition game session. And something I noticed that some of the players were having a really hard time with was understanding the movement in a uh, first edition segment was much smaller than the fifth edition that some of them are used to. In fifth edition, when you move um, every combat turn, if it says you can move 30 feet every combat turn, you can move 30 feet. So if you say, example, if you have some monsters over here, these blue ones, and uh, what will be our monsters and our parties over here and the white tokens. If you're a white token character that can move 30 feet and each square is five feet, you can move say, one, two, three, four, five, six squares. And the monster is the same way. Usually they can move either between 25 to 30 feet, depending upon the size of the monster. Or, you know, if they're larger, monster is bigger. But one, two, three, four, five. And these two could be engaged in combat right away. Um, and that's in 5th edition. And so that's what a lot of the, as the players that I'm playing this 1st edition game with are used to. So, and this becomes kind of confusing for them when we're talking 1st edition movement in combat. Because, of course, in 1st edition in combat... Um, everything happens in segments. So to kind of zoom in here a little bit here to the move things around to the uh, book here. And this is page 102 of the player's handbook. I should have shown that before I zoomed in. But uh, page 102 of the player's handbook, it shows movement rate. Uh, this six inch mark, for example, in one round or one minute, which is a total of 10 segments, you can move 60 feet. But each segment, you can move 6 feet or about one square. And that's if your movement rate is the 6 inch. If your movement rate is the 9, you can move 90 feet in a whole round. Or in a segment, about two squares. It'd be 9 feet. Um, so if you're using a grid system, that's what it's closest to. Uh, 12 uh, would be the 120, and then the 12. 15 would be the 150 in the whole minute, or just 15 feet in that segment, in that six minutes or six second segment. And the movement, if you, if you had a movement of 18, a big, big creature, 180 in a round, but that's only still only 18 in that segment. And of course, I had lots of players, or my players were trying to, um, like I said, do that whole. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, it says I can move. To, uh, you know, it says I can move that that great distance, but uh, and really, you just you can't. You can't actually move that sixty or that ninety, depending upon your gear or character. You're the only moving, pretty much one. If you're using the grid, one or two um, squares. If you're charging, you know, obviously you can go, but you can go twice that. But so if there's a big distance like that between creatures. It might take a few segments to get together, and that gives time for your archers to, to shoot. It gives time for your spellcasters maybe to get some spells off, especially if they're doing a multi-segment. You know, it's going to take more than more than that one um, segment that they're in. So, how does that translate into play? I have open here the entry for the goblin, which is right here, the goblin. And his movement is that six inch mark, that six, which we know from the table over here, that that is basically six feet per segment. That's that six feet per combat segment. So if these guys were goblins, they could be maybe doing one one if they're charging they can maybe do two you know they're not gonna they're not gonna get all the way across the board in six seconds you're not gonna get all the way across your battle mat in, in six seconds of course that gives time time for some tactics maybe you can have some if you're using the battle mat you could have some trees you could have some rock you could have some you know some uh the walls whatever that the that they might be um taking advantage of on both sides you know, one of the uh, scenarios in that treasure hunt um, module 
early on as you encounter these groups of uh, kobolds and goblins that are fighting each other and uh, and they're kind of going back and forth in the battle and the party can you know make decisions and they can you know, maybe choose to roll boulders down the hill or wade right into battle and die yeah, whichever one that they did decide would be most uh, fun for them to do. And uh, thankfully, the party that I went, was rolling with was actually cautious, and they decided to roll boulders, which enabled them to, uh, you know, um, route the uh, enemies down below, and they were able to get a few pieces of equipment that they didn't have, you know, clothing, because they started out with just a pair of pants, a pair of old ripped-up pants. So... Um, I mean, slowly building every precious item they collect is, you know, just that, that much more important to them. Um, although now when they reach the end of the, uh, of that module, they get like a boat and several thousand in gold and so forth if they, if they're successful. So, so, um, And of course, on page 102, it does go into a lot more detail. Um, for example, it, it, it really explains it fairly well here. Movement, uh, time and distance factors. Movement rate is always shown by a numeral followed by the sign for inches, thus nine inches. The number of inches moved is scaled to circumstances and time by modifying either the distance represented or the time or both. So, and you can, of course, when you go down to that distance traveled in one, round or segment and that really kind of makes that much more clear but um movement in the dungeon because everything's kind of based on that whole concept of dungeon the outdoor overland stuff really didn't even come in until the wilderness survival guide um made its big big debut debut uh, but movement in the dungeon the movement distance in the dungeon is one inch to 10 foot over a turn of 10 minutes duration while exploration and mapping are in progress so if they're following a map a known route, a known route um the movement rate it can be five times greater uh so that uh they can go you know 50 or you know, instead of going 60 they might be going 300 for example if they're fleeing, all movement excluding and count and encumbered movement is ten times faster. So they're really just running when they're fleeing. They're just getting out of there. They're not caring about anything. They're not worrying about what's up ahead. Of course, they might trip and fall. They might fall into a hidden ravine. Things like that can happen. But uh, when you're in combat situations, which is, of course, what I was started this uh, video talking about was the uh, combat scenario where everybody wanted to move way further and way faster than their, than their character should be able to in a, in a six-second segment, then um, that's where that was kind of coming from there. Uh, movement outdoors, of course, like I said, the Wilderness Survival Guide really blows up and expands encumbrance of movement, but their media it does talk about it here. The major difference in outdoor movement is distance and time. Each one inch equals the number of miles a character or a creature can travel in a half day. So you could travel 60 miles in half a day. Or, I'm sorry, six six miles they're saying here in, in half a day or 9 miles in half a day, or 12 miles in half a day, or 15 or 18 miles in half a day, which doesn't seem like a lot. Um, that surprisingly, it kind of is. Um, if you go on any longer 5, 10 mile hikes, um, moving 6 miles in half a day is pretty slow. Uh, you can usually do that like in a morning easily. I mean, doing you can do ten miles in you know in, in a morning pretty pretty easily if you have any athletic ability at all. So some of these are a little bit maybe on the slow side, but uh, maybe when you're short like the goblin, that uh, is more realistic. Movement in cities when your party is in an inhabited area like a city. Um, turns are in the same rate as when you're in a combat in a dungeon. So you'd use the same table, and uh, each move is a minute long. Uh, this assumes that no map is being made because you're in a city where you're probably just following streets and so forth. 
And um, finally, no mapping is possible when a party is moving at a fast speed, such as being pursued or pursuing. This mapping thing's kind of interesting too because uh, like my uh, 5e players who are playing 1e would uh, never even consider making a map. They're like, don't you provide that, right? You're just drawing that out on the battle map for us. We don't have to write a map out. Why would our characters go? Why would we take notes? <laughs> That's a whole other topic for a whole other video. Um, the importance of taking notes and remembering that NPC's name. Um, then the book kind of goes on to uh, other topics, light, infravision, so on and so forth. But uh, so pretty much the whole section on movement here is on page 102 of the Player's Handbook. But then, like I said, you get into the Wilderness Survival Guide. In this book, you have lots and lots of information on movement. Starts out on, on encumbrance, then it talks about terrain for movement, uh, normal terrain, rugged terrain, very rugged terrain, and how that's all going to affect uh, um, movement um, when you're on foot. And if you're encumbered, your encumbrance versus the terrain. So it really can um, modify and change those numbers. If you really want to get into uh, all of the modifications there. It's the interesting thing here, though, is the encumbrance limits and movements rates for animals. So you have everything from apes to bears to camels, um, dogs, donkeys, horses, of course, uh, yaks, giant rams. Gives you movement for various vehicles, wagons, and carts. So you can kind of figure all of that out. Um, so you would think that the uh, vehicle and the would be kind of depending upon what was pulling it, which maybe you can kind of uh, interpret that based upon those two, but there is a separate cart that it just, it, apparently the cart at least can't go any faster than that without falling apart. So, so then there's all kinds of different modifiers to non-thief climbing rates. And then uh, it kind of gets into some other smother um, stuff too, like how to belay yourself and roping together and stuff like that. But the big, um, movement piece in this book of course is right back here where he talks about the various creatures and the and how the various terrains can affect your movement of course none of that uh was very relevant in that game because um convincing everybody to move just one square or two squares that was a challenge on all of itself and i think for our next game we're going to have that figured out so pretty uh pretty optimistic there um, if you're following this channel at all, you'll no you'll know that I kind of reference this ostrich occasionally, especially for my new players here. And interesting thing in the ostrich is its section on movement is worthless. Uh, there's a little verbose, a uh, little bit of verbosity there, talking about encumbrance and your base movement rate. Tiny little section here on movement, nothing real clear or definitive uh it does take into account the moving cautiously and so forth but nothing nothing that really explains movement very well i guess not like it does on that page 102 of the player's handbook so if you are using the ostrich at all um just turn to page 102 of the of the first edition player's handbook that's a really nice well laid out section there on movement that explains the rule very clearly and uh, keeping in mind, it is different than the uh, other editions, the, uh, uh, especially 5th edition, which, like I said, he'd be moving this monster here instead of, you know, he'd be going out to here instead of to here, or maybe here, depending upon the creature. So, well, I hope this was uh, somewhat useful or informative. Uh, thank you for listening, and I will talk to you next time.